Okay. So what do we know about strokes? What do you guys remember about strokes from 200? What is it? Blood clot in the brain. Blood clot in the brain. What else could it be? A moving clot. A moving clot? There's another type of stroke. Hemorrhagic. Hemorrhagic, which is? Brain. Bleeding in the brain. So we have a couple different types, but as we were talking about the blockages in the heart, right? We have a blockage of some sort or a bleed of some sort. So we have a disruption of blood flow. The really cool thing about the brain is there's an auto regulation. And so when we have, your, I mean, your body doesn't have to think I need to perfuse the brain, right? It just does it. So how the vessels are created, it creates that auto regulation through the nervous system and blood flow. So when we have an interruption of that blood flow, we talk about time as tissue, right? Because depending on how long that blockage is taking place or how long that bleeding is taking place, then we have a loss of that auto regulation, okay? So we have a continuous supply of blood to the brain and oxygen um, that we need to function, okay? Usually if um, metabolism is altered within 30 seconds, it can stop within two minutes and then we have cellular, cellular death within five minutes. So again, remember we talked about MIs, the amount of time the blockage is present, time is tissue or time is death basically. Um, what else do you remember about strokes related to symptoms? We could have left or right side, depending on where it's at, that's going to show us what our symptoms are. Not only could we have left or right side, we could have um, a blockage in the cerebellum. What would that affect? Balance. Balance, yep, very good. So one third of stroke patients don't survive, one third have permanent disabilities, and one third do not have residual disabilities. Again, it's dependent on how long that blockage is there or how severe it is. So there's a couple different classifications here. Ischemic, this is our blockage, right? Thrombotic, which is caused by atherosclerosis. Um, this is 60% of your strokes, so probably the most common that you're gonna see. Um, ischemic, the overall classification, there's about that's about 87% of strokes. So if you guys were at Madonna um, or on 8 North, you probably saw most of them were this type of ischemic stroke. Um, why does atherosclerosis increase the chance of a stroke? Yeah, there's already plaque there and present, so it's already narrowing that vessel. So the likelihood of a blockage occurring increases. Um, an embolic stroke is when um, there is an embolus becomes lodged in the cerebral artery, causing an infarction and edema to the area surrounding it, okay? So I think it goes beyond just the vessel. It kind of causes edema and swelling um, beyond that specific area. And these are usually caused by heart-related conditions or cardiac conditions. So your AFib patients, um, your MI patients, rheumatic heart disease, they have an increased risk for this embolic stroke. The other classification is hemorrhagic. So as you're thinking about this, as you're studying, I want you to create these two columns or two categories with ischemic and hemorrhagic. How are they different and how are they the same? How are the interventions different? How is one going to affect the other, okay? So hemorrhagic, um, this is, occurs from spontaneous bleeding. How would this occur? How would we see a hemorrhagic stroke happen like? Trauma, yep, an aneurysm, right? So that vessel is stretching, 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 and then eventually that vessel just ruptures, right? These patients have a poor prognosis um, and is the most common cause of um, intracerebral hemorrhaging. The other type is subarachnoid. And this is where we have bleeding into the cerebral spinal space, okay? 
This is usually caused from the rupture of an aneurysm. So we're gonna go into a little bit more about ischemic strokes. Again, we said this is the most common type. Um, what are the risk factors for patients who might have one of these? Hypertension. What else? Smoking. 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 Yep. Mm -hmm. Kind of all the things that you keep seeing, right? Anything cardiac related, neuro related, it's the same things over and over. Um, again, the extent depends on how rapidly the stroke begins and the size of the damage. And if there's collateral circulation, what does that mean? Hey, yeah, exactly. So remember when we talked about MIs and a cabbage is we're rerouting that blood flow to the heart. Same thing happens here is your brain says there's a blockage here. Well, there's a blockage in the middle of the road. I'm going to find a different way to supply blood to that area. Okay. So it depends on how much blood flow there is in the collateral circulation on the severity of the stroke as well. Um, elderly, this usually occurs during or immediately after sleep. And sometimes they wake up with no neurological deficits. That's kind of difficult to figure out when things happened, right? So they're asleep, they don't know, they wake up and feel like nothing's wrong. Um, within the first 24 hours, you can have um, no loss of consciousness, but an increased blood pressure. So if someone has hypertension, you might not know that you're actively having a stroke, right? Your only symptom might be increased blood pressure. Manifestations usually progress within the first 72 hours. Um, there is an increased risk of or incidence of TIAs. What's a TIA? And how are those different than a stroke? Yeah, so the symptoms go away pretty quickly, right? And there's no sort of residual effect. Um, usually, or I, there can be people with TIAs um, prior to a stroke, right? So maybe it's a kind of a, a partial clot, not a full clot. Um, that TIA gets resolved, and then they're more likely to um, experience an ischemic stroke. And usually these TIAs, they're brief and episodic, um, last usually five to 10 minutes. Neural deficits are usually gone within 24 hours. Um, most are gone within three hours. So again, if someone's sleeping, you may not realize um, that they just had a TIA, okay? So embolic strokes, these can occur at any age. They're sudden onset. Um, they're uncommon for warning signs compared to the TIA, right? Severe manifestations, what would that look like? Facial drooping, one side of body weakness. So some neurological deficits can be vary depending on where it's at. Their blood pressure might be normal a headache after infarction is pretty common. Again, no loss of consciousness in the first 24 hours, but signs and symptoms do worsen over the next 72 hours due to that cerebral edema. Remember with this one, there's areas around it that are swelling. So they're compressing on things which can cause those neuro deficits. There's usually poor functional outcomes because there's no time for that collateral circulation to develop. And again, these result in more cerebral edema and increased um, intracranial pressures. With these types, reoccurrence is common um, unless the cause is treated successfully. And there are instances where these clots can break up into smaller clots or break apart and then occlude other vessels. So that's why the reoccurrence um, can happen.
So hemorrhagic strokes, these are spontaneous and progressive. So remember with ischemic, um, whether embolic, it's sudden. These are more progressive, okay? And they progressively decline, um, continues over minutes to hours due to the bleeding. Obviously, the longer it goes, the more severe it's gonna be. Um, these are often associated with some sort of activity, um, like I heard trauma. Etiology, you guys mentioned hypertension, any sort of bleeding risk, um, something that might have a brain tumor or an aneurysm, they're at risk for these types. With this, there is a mass effect. So what that means is it displaces brain tissue. So as you have a bleed, that swelling, pushing on that brain tissue, um, which is going to further compress those blood vessels. Okay. <clears throat> severe manifestations, they're gonna have a severe headache, extremely high uh, blood pressures, they're going to have nausea or vomiting, often a decreased level of consciousness. So that's one difference between the two, right? We've talked about the other ones. Usually there's no loss of consciousness. This one, there is decreased level of consciousness. It's not uncommon to see your blood pressures over 200 um, and your diastolic over 110. They're also at risk for seizures, and these patients have high mortality rates. With the subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, these often occur from a cerebral aneurysm rupture, okay? This could be onset by trauma or um, illicit drug use as well. These are also sudden onset. There's no warning signs. Um, this is the one where they say, I have the worst headache of my life. Working in the ED, it's important to hear them say that or acknowledge this symptom. <clears throat> Lots of times you'll have someone with a migraine come in and said, this is the worst headache of my life. But in the ED, we're ruling out this, right? So we'll get to some diagnostics, but take whatever they say seriously. If they say, this is the worst headache my, of my life, I'm automatically looking for other signs and symptoms that this might be a hemorrhagic stroke, okay? Level of consciousness can vary from comatose to alert depending on the severity of the bleed. They will often have um, some cranial nerve deficits, nausea and vomiting, seizures. They might complain of a stiff neck or be unable to turn their head due to that um, bleed into the subarachnoid space and causing irritation to those meninges. There is a rapid decrease in their neurological status. If someone is experiencing a hemorrhagic stroke, 40% um, of these patients will die. And so, like we said, it um, can progress very quickly and um, they can progress to complete paralysis um, or into a coma or death. Complications, re-bleed, right? We fixed them, they can re-bleed again. Um, that vessel is now weakened, right? Because it's already um, ruptured or the aneurysm's already ruptured. They can have vasospasms and increase intracranial pressure. Are you guys doing okay so far? <coughs> Is this new or kind of a review for you? It's been a while, it's been a while so, since 200, so I figured we'd, we'd go through it just to refresh you. We didn't dive this deep into You didn't dive? Okay. That's good to know. We had two charts and that was kind of what it was. Okay, well now you have 50 slides, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna do a patho diagram after this so you guys can kind of put the pieces together um, after you've learned it. 
So clinical manifestations, um, there's usually no significant difference in neural deficits between the types of strokes, okay? So regardless, they're gonna have some sort of neural deficit. The difference depends on where it's at in the brain. So right brain, left brain, cerebellar, or the brainstem, okay? Um, rate of onset, like we've talked about, I keep saying this, usually more severe. Um, size of lesion can um, tell you basically more neural deficits, like we talked about the one with the cerebral um, swelling. Collateral circulation, if they have time to develop that reroute of blood flow, you might see a decrease in that neural deficit. So with right brain strokes, which side of the body is going to be affected? Yes. Left, yes, opposite. So we say contralateral hemiparesis or hemiplegia. Left side is paralyzed or decreased in movement. Um, this also applies to vision and touch. So usually these patients will have decreased um, left visual field deficit. So we're placing things on the right side for them, correct? They also have problems with depth perception. Um, so think of your spatial kind of visual deficits with these patients. They often ignore their left side. They're un also unaware of this deficit, okay? They may have agnosia, which is the inability to recognize object by sight, sound, or touch. So think again, spatial perceptual deficits. They can also have memory deficits, so they have a short attention span, they might be disoriented, impaired concept of time, and can occasionally get lost easily. Again, they're not aware of their deficit, so they may be in some sort of denial, um, have some impaired judgment, maybe they might have some socially inappropriate behaviors, um, deny or minimize their problems. They are often impulsive and can be cheerful or euphoric because they think nothing's wrong, right? Why would I, why would I um, be down or, you know, things like that. These patients can also have, um, let me go back. So talking about left brain, now we're moving to right brain, or sorry, right brain we talked about, now we're moving to left brain. So with these patients, the right side is gonna be affected. Also, these patients will have difficulty swallowing. So one easy way, easier way to remember is left brain is going to be usually about speech and swallowing. And right brain, again, is about that spatial visual. So these patients are at risk for, they have dysphagia, what are they at risk for? <clears throat> Aspiration, <throat> yep. Aspiration, pneumonia, leading to cause of death post-stroke. Usually it's not the stroke itself, but the aspiration um, that could cause death. They have a language deficit. Um, so expressive aphasia or Broca's aphasia, or they can have receptive aphasia. So expressive meaning they have trouble verbalizing their words. Receptive meaning they don't understand what you're saying. They can have also dysarthria, which is um, an impairment of the muscular control of their speech. So they know what they're trying to say, but it maybe comes out stuttering or um, kind of garbled speech. They have trouble with their pronunciations or articulations. As far as vision and touch, again, they're gonna have that right left um, or right discrimination, visual field deficit on the right side difficulty of reading and writing. 
their behaviors. Usually they're slow and cautious, maybe a little bit disorganized. Um, they can have anxiety or depression because this type, they are aware of their deficits. They get frustrated very easily. They can lose control of their emotions. And again, they have that impaired comprehension related to language. Cerebellar stroke. So again, this um, affects their balance, right? And produces some physical manifestations. There's usually minimal effect on their thinking, um, but they have movement deficits. So ataxia, meaning poor balance, um, difficulty with hand-eye coordination. They can have some dysphagia. Um, they might have trouble articulating things. So blurred vision, double vision, um, vertigo or de decreased sensation. Does anybody know what dysdiadokinesia is? It's a long word. <clears throat> it is actually the inability to perform rapid alternating movements. So one of the um, tasks that they will do is having them flip their hands over back and forth on their legs. They are unable to do that. Okay, so think balance equal, right? They have trouble um, with that. So those would be a um, cerebellar stroke. So what's that called? It is called oh. dysdiad. Dicokinesia, D-I-S-D-I-A-D-O-C-H-O. I'm going to stop there for you. I just can't pronounce it. Sorry. <laughs> and the last one, brainstem stroke. Usually poor outcomes, right? Brainstem affects our breathing, our heart rate, our temperature, swallowing. So... This would be often pretty fatal, okay? Depending on the time. All right, so you guys probably remember from 200 or your experience in clinical, we wanna modify those risk factors. Decrease the atherosclerosis by diet and exercise, limit their smoking, limit their alcohol, right? Um, they're on statins for their lipids. Um, they're usually on some sort of plate, platelet aggregate inhibitor, your aspirin, Plavix. If they've had a TIA, they are a high risk patient, so they're usually on this. Anticoagulation, we want to prevent those clots, right? So your warfarin, Xeralto, Eliquis, you guys know these meds. So taking it into emergency management. So we kind of went through all the different types of strokes. So now we have someone who's coming in or maybe out on the street. We want early recognition. We're gonna activate the EMS protocol called 911, even if it might be a TIA, right? Because we don't know if those symptoms are gonna resolve right away or if it's going to prolong. So always thinking ABCs, we need an airway, right? We might need to intubate them if they're decreasing in level of consciousness or depending on if that heart rate, breathing, if it's a um, brainstem stroke. They're gonna be on continuous oxygen, right? Because we don't have oxygen to the brain. We're gonna give them some. Their breathing pattern could be irregular, unlabored, or unlabored. Sorry, breathing pattern can be regular or unlabored. And then we want to control their blood pressure. So usually there's some sort of protocol um, that we follow and we're going to give them some normal saline. Why would we not want to give them glucose? Because that could be, they could be hypoglycemic. They could so, be. What am I trying to say? Well, so we had a stroke patient come into Jenny on Okay. And they immediately checked her blood sugars just to make rule out hypoglycemic. Correct. So, yeah, because they can mimic the same signs, <clears throat> yeah. right? So, but why wouldn't we want to give them glucose? It thickens the blood, so it would stop the blood from flowing. 
Yeah, and actually glucose, it causes um, swelling. So an edema and increase, can increase the size of the infarction. So that is a great point because you wanna know what their glucose level is in case they are hypoglycemic as well. So diagnostic testing, a CT without contrast is the gold standard. So in emergency, we wanna rule out any of the big, bad, and ugly, right? So we're gonna send them to CT right away without contrast to rule out any sort of hemorrhage, any sort of brain tumor, um, any aneurysm, identify any sort of edema or necrotic tissue. Typically, edema is not going to show up on your scan for six to 12 hours, okay? So that's also good to know if you do see that, Maybe we know that this stroke happened earlier than what we thought. Maybe they were asleep, they woke up with some deficits. We don't know when the last time well was. Labs, again, we're gonna rule out any sort of metabolic issues like we talked about the hypoglycemia. Um, what are some other things that can mimic strokes? What are some other diagnosis or things that look like strokes? Bell's palsy, epilepsy, tumors, encephalitis, yep. Um, we can do an MRI and this will determine the extent of the brain injury, okay? But again, it's not our first line um, diagnostic test. It just tells us how much of the area is involved and what the vascular supply is. For a hemorrhagic stroke, um, again, a CT is still gonna be our gold standard, but in addition, um, a cerebral angio angiography is going to tell us what the cerebral vasculature looks like, okay? Because we're looking at that bleed and we wanna determine how patent are those blood vessels still. Um, and actually a CT angiogram can be done at the same time as a CT. So our treatments for an ischemic stroke, remember this is our blockage. So what do we wanna do? We wanna get rid of the blockage, right? So we can use um, fibrolytics, such as our TPA. This is our clot buster. This must be given in three to four and a half hours from the last known time normal, okay? There are strict protocols and guidelines that exclude um, those that should not receive TPA. We wanna monitor closely for any sort of signs of improvement or deterioration. So we're looking for those signs and symptoms of intracerebral hemorrhage or bleeding. Um, it's really important to maintain their blood pressure less than 185 during administration and for 24 hours after. We're gonna be performing frequent neuro checks on them every 15 minutes. Uh, for a couple hours, then 30 minutes, then um, decrease down to an hour. They are at an increased risk for bleeding for the first 36 hours, right? Because now we've busted that clot. What would be some signs and symptoms that you would look for if someone was progressing to bleeding? What is their body gonna do to compensate for that bleed? Tachycardia. Tachycardia, yep. What else? Hypogallia. Uh-huh, yep. Low blood pressure, yeah. You would think it would be the opposite, but your heart rate is increasing, your blood pressure is decreasing because they're bleeding out, right? They're gonna be a little restless, pale. Think of your perfusion, how do they look? 
if bleeding is occurring, then we're gonna give them some platelets, fresh frozen plasma, we need to replace that blood. Another thing we can do is we can go in um, through the fem femoral artery, we can inject some TPA directly into the clot. This is called the intra-arterial lysis. Um, this is done, has to be done within six hours, and it's only done by specialized neurosurgeons. So I think the only hospital in Omaha that can do it is UNMC. Unless, I don't know if Bergen is able to now, but I think UNMC. That's where she went. Okay. So another method um, we can do is endovascular therapy. And so with this, they go in and they open the block arteries by using a removable stent system. So they use a catheter, they guide it up into um, the, through the femoral artery into the blockage. And it's kind of cool because they use that stent and then they grab that clot and the stent and the clot comes out, okay? For a hemorrhagic stroke, um, again, we're gonna provide a neuro consult and these patients are not going to receive any sort of anticoagulants or platelet inhibitors, right? So are they a candidate for TPA? No. For these patients, again, you wanna keep their blood pressure down, usually below 160. Oftentimes these require surgical decompression because we need to um, evacuate that aneurysm. Sometimes they'll perform a clipping, so they'll go to surgery. Again, this is a specialized um, procedure, and they'll clip off that aneurysm to block the blood flow or the bleed, um, and that stays there. It helps prevent that aneurysm from rupturing. Another mechanism is coiling. Um, again, I think UNMC does this as well. Basically, a coil is inserted into the aneurysm um, and it protects against that hemorrhaging um, from occurring. Some medications. You guys are familiar with these? Nicardipine, nitroprusside, labetalol. So again, we're taking down that blood pressure, but we may need some vasopressors to prevent them from bottling out, right? Sometimes we're too good at our job and we take them too low. So then we might, might need to give them a little bit of a presser um, to bring them up a little bit. There's usually a high instance of um, vasospasms. So we use um, nimidopine. This is a calcium channel blocker to prevent those vasospasms. We wanna assess their blood pressure and their apical pulse before we give that. This is a, an extremely, extremely expensive medication. Um, it's upwards of $5,000 and they would be on this for 21 days, two tabs a day. So if we don't have to use this, that's great, but it, just know it's extremely expensive. Um, seizure prophylaxis, prophylaxis. So these patients are going to be on their gabapentin, dilantin, Keppra. So back to nursing assessment. We talked about this with the EMS activation system. What are we looking for? ABCs, airway. What else are we doing? Related to their airway, that risk for dysphagia. So what are we monitoring? NPO. NPO, yes. We put them on NPO. We don't want them to aspirate, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say their um, pressure is increasing, their intracerebral pressure is increasing. Their respiration rate might go down, right? So monitoring for any sort of respiratory distress. 
may need to intubate them. We've already talked about hypoxemia, oxygen. We're gonna give them some O2. Blood pressure control. And then one of the most important things is comprehensive neurological exam. Okay, like we, if you guys were in clinical with us, we talked about this briefly. Um, you will be specifically trained um, to perform a comprehensive neuro exam through the NIHS scale. Um, so we can determine what neuro deficits they are, they have, and how they're progressing. Okay, so vital signs and neural checks every hour, if not more. If they have a decreased level of consciousness or change in level of consciousness, you are doing that neuro check again. With progressive decreased level of consciousness, that indicates decreased or poor perfusion and decreased blood flow to the brain. What's another assessment we want to do for um, checking their level of consciousness or cognition status? Besides RAS, okay. If you've been with me in clinical, what do I write on your care plan every single week that you miss for cognition? Perla. Perla, yeah. If they can't follow <laughs> commands, how are we gonna assess their neural status? We're looking at their pupils, right? Mm -hmm. So, Lindsay? Yeah. We're looking at pupil size. Right. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so yeah, when you're looking at your pupils, the big piece for them is that they're equal. Yep. And they respond together. Mm-hmm. Okay. And also, for the people that are with me, what else is important? Thinking fast. Well, thinking fast for a hero, okay? What else? What about with the pupils? Like oh. They're brisk. They're brisk. The mm -hmm. speed. Yep. So like, even the pupillary change of um, sluggish, like they were brisk, and then all of a sudden they're sluggish and they're not moving as much as they were. Either we just know them with meds, mm -hmm. <laughs> or they, they've had some sort of cognitive change. So your pupils can tell you a lot. However, they are a late sign. Yep. So and we'll dive more into that too when we get into head trauma. But so get used to doing that. your Glasgow coma scale. Um, I don't know if you guys are doing that, but you should be. And then, like we said, your NIH stroke scale will be um, more in depth. This is an example of an NIH stroke scale. Um, for testing purposes, you do not need to memorize this, but I want you to know what it's for, okay? Um, the higher the number, the worse the stroke, right? So as you can see, when we're looking at level of consciousness, zero is alert, coma is a three, okay? Um, pupillary response, both reactive, one reactive, or neither reactive. So know that the higher the number, the worse the deficit. Um, part of that is asking them to repeat these words. You can quickly identify usually which side it might be on, depending on how they verbalize it, or if they can repeat what you say, right? I think I had a video. There is a video um, in the PowerPoint, so if you want to watch um, them demonstrate the NIH stroke scale, you can um, watch that video. So we keep talking about interventions. Um, again, dysphagia, we're gonna elevate the head of the bed, 30 degrees. We may need a swallow study performed. <clears throat> Again, their NPO, encouraging cough and deep breathing, suction as needed unless they have an aneurysm. Why would we not suction if they have an aneurysm? Yeah, we could increase that pressure. We cause that aneurysm to rupture. Again, we said normal saline, no dextrose for 24 hours. Again, that dextrose can increase their um, Cerebral edema and infarct size. 
but we do want some glycemic control. For 24 hours, yep. What can you do to, in to prevent increased um, intracerebral pressures or intracranial pressures? What was that? Who said? Increased blood pressure? Decreased blood pressure. Yep. What else can we do? What are some just tangible things in the room, not necessarily medication related? Turn the lights down. Yeah. Remember we talked about aortic aneurysms. What do we do? Decreased stimulus of the environment, right? They're on bed rest, low stimulation. Um, you want that head of the bed elevated to 50 to 30 degrees and keeping their head midline. You want to monitor their eyes and nose, preventing that overhydration or increased um, edema. Seizure precautions. What are we going to do for these patients? Suction. Pat the bed. Suction if they don't have an aneurysm, right? Yes. Yep. What do we need in case their airway goes kaput? Uh, Ambu bag, yep. We need an airway at the bedside. If they are actively seizing, what are we gonna do with the patient? Put them on their side, why? Yes, so they don't aspirate. All right, quick little quiz. The nurse is receiving a report on a client who had a stroke. The nurse states the client is if possible to understand they are anxious with new tasks and very depressed. The nurse receiving the nurse recognizes this as what kind of stroke? Uh, left. Left. Because why? They're aware of their deficits. Yes, aware of their deficits and difficult with difficulty with speech. Which of these clients is most at risk for a hemorrhagic stroke? 55-year-old with a flutter, 65-year-old male with um, carotid stenosis, an 88-year-old male with uncontrolled hypertension and a history of brain aneurysm repaired two years ago, or D, an 89-year-old female with atherosclerosis? C. Why'd you pick C? Yep, uncontrolled hypertension puts strain on those blood vessels, right? Predisposing them to that rupture. What are A, B, and D at risk for? What type? Ischemic stroke. Yep. Mm -hmm. The client's MRI shows damage to the cerebellum a week after they suffered a stroke. What assessment findings would correlate with this MRI finding? A, balance, right? The nurse could also ask them to perform those repetitive movements. Remember, pronation and supination on those hands, heel to the shin, testing for balance and coordination. Client has a right brain stroke. Select all the signs and symptoms that occur with this type of stroke. <laughs> so I hear impaired judgment, I hear left side neglect. <clears throat> Impulsive. Impulsive. Yep. So these are indicative of motor movement, that hemianopsia, neglecting that side. And again, they're going to be impulsive, have impaired judgment, and not aware of their de deficits. The client has a left brain stroke. Select all the signs and symptoms that occur with this type of stroke. A, aphasia. Depression and anger. C. 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 Issues with seeing on the right side. D. D. Yep. Depression and anger. Also E. Yep. Language and math skills for these. So again, they have deficits on the opposite side of the body. Um, they will be aware of their deficits that can lead to that depression and anger and also difficulty with um, language and math.
All right, so we talked about these. Um, some things that we might see also with neuromotor function is weakness um, as far as the arm, leg, facial paralysis, um, eyelid drooping. We talked about communication, that expressive aphasia, receptive aphasia, and articulation. Um, we talked about personality and affect, kind of their demeanor. Are they depressed or euphoric? Um, are they cautious or impulsive? So start categorizing these strokes um, into the different types here. Um, I kind of talked through all that. Some of this is repetitive. So you guys, you guys are getting it. So with these patients, um, to maintain optimal function, we want to support those extremities, right? So if they have um, paralysis on one side, we don't want that limb always hanging down, right? So we're going to put some pillows underneath them, um, prevent that edema, support them with braces, um, using that gait belt. These are great pictures to remind you of when you're moving these patients, blocking their knees, right? Because that knee might give out, they're going down. Lots of safety with these patients assisting with transfers. Um, they're gonna be tired. So clustering your cares is important, providing rest after that activity. Um, if they increase in um, fatigue, their neurological deficits can increase as well. We wanna prevent complications, skin breakdown, right? So we're positioning them, changing positions every two hours. Um, Position on the affected side for only 30 minutes and then we're offloading it, okay? They might need special mattresses, cushions, um, lots of exercises, PT, hand splints, arm slings, those kind of things. For the patient with dysphagia, again, they're at risk for aspiration, so no thin liquids. Okay, no water, no straws. Um, they may need to be supported with tube feedings or an N, by an NG tube or PEG tube. Um, they do need to consult with speech therapy to conduct a swallow screening um, before they come off of NPO. So usually they'll progress from some sort of thickened liquid um, back to regular diet. Um, with these patients, you want to assess for any sort of pocketing. They'll maybe tuck that food in there because that side's a little lazy um, and chewing. Lots of guided cues. Again, not only just that, but correct positioning for their head for eating. If you were at Madonna or um, watch speech therapy or occupational therapy, help them with this. I mean, you probably saw them saying the same things over and over, like, Keep your head and neck, you know, tucking as you swallow, right? Um, let's see. Monitoring for nutrition. We're going to get a um, protein level, an albumin level, some labs in there. I feel like we kind of talked about this already. Do you guys feel pretty good with the different types of aphasia? Okay. What was the global one? Sorry. That's... This is total loss of comprehension and language. So severe impaired comprehension. Um, they're not able to verbalize. Sometimes they just repeat what they heard because there's no sort of process that I need to respond. You have to be very patient with them, right? Using simple words and phrases, yes or no questions. Positive reinforcement, encouragement, lots of verbal prompts, visual cues. Maybe you need to use show me one for yes, 
give me two for no. Picture boards, any sort of alternate um, communication styles. Oftentimes these patients will get very frustrated easily um, with the loss of independence and their increased dependency on others. So recognizing those cues and kind of giving them time and space, but also encouraging them. Providing explanations, um, including family. This is a big one, um, including them in their cares, providing them opportunities for socialization, um, teaching family member what you're teaching them, right, the patient, so they can go home and continue those cares. And I feel like these are kind of repetitive, so. We haven't talked about bowel and bladder yet. So um, for the bowel, usually these problems will occur initially and they're often temporary. Um, constipation is the most common due to immobility, right? So we're gonna increase their fiber, um, hydrate them, If they have a neurogenic bowel, um, usually they'll be incontinent. They lack the control um, or sensation to have a bowel movement. With the bladder, same thing, um, can lead to incontinence. So the urge to suddenly void um, with the ability to maintain continence, but with stress um, incontinence, usually that's, they um, have a loss of urine with uh, things that put stress on the bladder, meaning increased abdominal pressure, things like that. Sneezing, coughing, if you've had kids, you know what I'm talking about, so. Functional, um, bladder, usually this is impaired to the cognitive status, um, so they don't have the signal going to their bladder that they need to void, okay? So know the differences between these different types of incontinence. So if they have a neurogenic bowel, what are we gonna do for them? They don't have the pathway to stimulate their bowels. So what do we need to do? For the bowels? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Frequent checks to make sure they, if they did have a bowel movement, if not, you're gonna give them yeah, we can also put them on toileting schedule, right? So think about potty training in a sense, like frequency. You're gonna put them on the toilet every couple of hours. Your body might remember, hey, I'm sitting on the toilet, I need to defecate. Um, so initiate your bowel program. We can also give them suppositories um, or provide any sort of stimulation for the defecation. How about the bladder? Jamie? <laughs> now we can, we can provide a catheter, right? First we wanna assess for that post void residual. Um, if they're having retention, we might need to straight cath them. Again, offering that toilet assistance, bell, or um, bathroom every couple of hours, encourage them to get up to the commode. Lots of times they will just wanna do a bedpan teach them pelvic floor exercises. Also teaching them signs and symptoms of urinary infection, right? So any changes in um, neurological status, like we said, can be um, Worsening of the stroke, so it could change from um, an embolic to hemorrhagic. Um, 
All changes you want to report to the doctor, especially any changes in blood pressure, either high or low, we're going to report to the MD. As you know, these patients are going to go through long-term therapy, right? Lots of rehab. Madonna, QLI, um, CHI has a significant rehab program as well. So you've got PT, you've got OT, you've got speech therapy, you've got recreational therapy, um, working on all those deficits, assistive devices, providing family education and resources, um, they can progress from acute rehab. Um, they do need to be able to withstand three hours of therapy to go to acute rehab. So a lot of times that's what prevents patients from discharging from the hospital. Um, is they don't have that um, buildup of endurance yet to withstand that therapy. Skilled rehab is usually a slower process. Um, so they can attend that as well. Again, this occurs over many, many months. Um, flaccid muscles after several weeks indicates a poor prognosis. So maybe that's going to be just a long-term deficit that they have, uh, may not regain complete function. Know the signs and symptoms of a stroke, right? You guys see these signs everywhere in the hospital, maybe hopefully outside of the hospital is as well. Their quick assessment, be fast. Balance, checking their eyes, double vision, facial droop, arms, one drifting down, speech, do they slur their words, and time, when is their last time known well? All right, a couple more questions and we're done. Clinician is providing education to a client with a recent diagnosis of a transient ischemic attack. Which of the statements by the client indicates that the client understands the information? B. B. Yep. So TIAs can lead to often an ischemic stroke. So we're still going to call EMS, report it, even if it's temporary impairment, right? Symptoms resolve. They still need a CT without contrast and hopefully some medical attention and um, education to prevent a future stroke. Which of these measures should be included in the plan of care to prevent complications in a client who is recovering from a stroke? I hear lots of answers. Give me a reason. I'm hearing all. So, keywords in the question prevent complications. Yes, answer is B. All need to have a swallow study completed prior to oral intake to prevent aspiration. Um, there are increased risks of dysphagia, complications resulting in pneumonia, right? Good. So again, all of these are correct, but keyword being preventing the complication. Client who has experienced a hemorrhagic stroke secondary to subarachnoid hemorrhage is being monitored in the ICU. The clinician notes that the client's intracranial pressure is 28. What, which of the following interventions should be taken first? D, why do you pick D? Correct, yep. So raising the head increases that venous return from the brain back to the heart, right? Keeping a low stimulation environment and not clustering cares. Yep. 
And why do we not want a suction? Yep, increase the risk of rupture. Mm -hmm. okay. Nurses communicating with the client with expressive aphasia, select all the ways to effectively communicate with this client. A and E. So what does ex expressive aphasia mean? Yep, they can understand, but they can't express what they want to say or can't respond effectively. So we want to be direct with them, ask simple questions, simple yes or no responses, and use a dry board, um, communication dry board. Yep. <laughs> Nurses assessing the client's pupil size and vision after stroke. The client says they can only see half the objects in the room. The nurse documents this finding as? C. C. Yes. Visual deficit on half the side. Okay, do you guys feel like you have a pretty good understanding of strokes? Maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> First time, right? Um, so take a quick break and then when you come back, I want you to pair up with a partner and then I'm going to give you either ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke and I want you guys to diagram. I'll kind of start you off um, with a pathodiagram of how that's different than a comp map. So take a quick break and then we'll come back.